Hi, I'm Ed Wilkinson, and you're watching On the Block. Today we're going to be talking to Father Christopher O'Connor, who's the pastor of St. Mary's Parish in Winfield, better known as Blessed Virgin Mary, Help of Christians, right? There we go. Okay. Now let me take you back. I want to take you back to 1989, before you were even a priest, because I know you were somewhere special and you're doing something very special, something different. Tell us, where were you? I was stationed in Germany with the United States Air Force. I injured right out of high school, and it was my second assignment. A uh, small little air base, and uh, 89 was great because that's when the Berlin Wall came down. So I was actually on a retreat that weekend for a Curseal, and I came out home and driving back home, there's all these cars lined up around the gas stations, they're East German cars. It's like, what the heck happened? <laughs> I got home, the stars of stripes, that Berlin Wall came down, we didn't even know. Mm -hmm. So it was a great time to be there in Germany. The wall came down, and it, with that year, Germany was yeah. reunified. So how did the country change? Did you see a lot of changes at the, in that time? Well, you saw a lot because uh, the people in East Germany have suffered so much under communist oppression, uh, poor housing, lack of work. Uh, so West Germany at that time really took on the brunt of the reunification and uh, families being reunited. But there was a lot of pride. And then also, like, right after that, Germany were in the World Cup in soccer. So a great chance for Germany to be unified behind a common cause. Did you enjoy your time in the service? I really did. The only reason I left was to go into the seminary. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made a career out of it. Well, why did you go into the Air Force? Oh, lots of reasons. Uh, number one, I was always a patriot. I always loved my country. And my grandfather, on my dad's side, my O'Connor, when he came from Ireland, he joined the Navy, served during World War II. My dad was in the Air Force, served during Vietnam. And it was just logical for me to follow their footsteps. I was proud of my dad and his service. And uh, also, I didn't want to go to college right away. I wanted to, to explore life and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah, today, you know, I think people appreciate the people who serve in the service a lot. You know, they, they thank you for your service a lot. Did you get the feeling that when you came out, people were appreciative of uh, you having oh, done Oh, very much so. People always came up and said, thank you for your service. Uh, I did serve during uh, the Persian Gulf War, the first one, when Saddam invaded Kuwait. And I marched in a parade in New York City afterwards, the Tech Parade. So when you were a young kid, before you went into the service and you were in high school, grammar school, did you ever think about becoming a priest? I didn't go to church as a kid. <laughs> I didn't go to church. I was one of those kids that, after confirmation, never went back. So I didn't go to church again until basic training, actually. And the reason I went was on Sundays, we had two options. You could stay in the barracks and clean or go to church. Mm. I hate cleaning, so I went to church instead. Uh -huh. And then listening to the homily and to the music, uh, I just felt the Lord call my heart. Wow. I came back to the faith. Yeah. You went to public school. You went to public school and you went to uh, Martin Luther High school, school in Maspeth, yeah. which is a little school that a lot of people don't know a lot about, right? right. Uh, uh, did that have anything to do at all with you not going to church, being in public no, school? No, no. Um, I went to Martin Luther for one main reason. Uh, it's 15 minutes away from my house by walking. I hated waking up in the morning. So I made my communion and confirmation in St. Dan's in Maspeth, and it's right down the block. So my dad was friends with the headmaster of Martin Luther. My dad was the manager of O'Neill's restaurant in Maspeth. So um, so you made introduction, so I wanted to go to a place smaller. And my public school was big crowds, so I went to Martin Luther. I had a good time. The teachers were good to me, although I was a self-proclaimed atheist in my four years there. Uh -huh. You, you, you sound like a lot of young people, you know, who just say, uh, I'm an atheist, you know, right. and uh, most of them don't even know what it means, actually. You're in the service and you're listening to homilies and something clicks. I mean, what was it? That... We all have that emptiness in our heart that only can be filled by God. And being away from home and, you know, not sure what's going on, people yelling at you constantly, the basic training, and I found consolation at Mass. And then as my training went on, I just found myself drawing more and more to the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And then I found myself being drawn going to the tabernacle. I didn't even know what the tabernacle was. I didn't ever learn it in CCD. But I just knew something was special about it. And then I learned that's where we reserved the Eucharist. And I just felt the Lord call me more and more. And then when I was stationed in Germany, uh, I went to Adoration, the Blessed Sacrament, the first time. Uh, our chaplain had it. I never was. And when he exposed Jesus in the monstrance, in the, in the incense, I just started crying. 20-year-old kid start crying because it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so. did you understand at that time that that was the real presence, or what did you think it was? I don't think I knew consciously what it was, but my heart knew. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really the beginning uh, to see sort of my vocation to the priesthood. What did you do? Did you go talk to the chaplain about it? Uh, actually, what happened was I went to Holy Week for the first time when I was stationed in Germany. And I went to uh, the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday, washed on the feet, Good Friday, kissing the cross. 
and on Holy Saturday Easter Vigil in the darkness, bring the candle in, and the chaplain asked me to serve each one of those liturgies. And so I could pray, and on Easter Monday, I was praying in the barracks by my bed and telling the Lord, I felt such great joy. And I never put this joy before my life. I said, how can I keep this joy always? And I heard a voice in my head say to me, be a priest. And I went, what? And he goes, be a priest. And I freaked out. I ran out of my room, I ran across the street, I ran to a pay phone. I called Home Collect to talk to my mom. And my dad answered the phone. And I told my dad what happened. And he didn't know how to answer it. He was like, you're crazy? And I was like, I don't know, look, Dad, this is different. I never felt anything like this. Like, I felt... So from then on, I went to the chaplain, I talked to him. He said, since you grew up in Queens, you went to the Diocese of Brooklyn, you should write them. I wrote to the Franciscans, wrote to the Dominicans. And uh, I said, I finished my time in the military. What are the other guys in the service? Did you share this feeling with any of them? Um, not right away. Like, when I told them I was leaving, become a priest. All my friends said, oh, we always knew. Really? Yeah, it was weird. These are guys who I go out with, you know, and hang out with and have good times with. But I would always go to Mass on Sunday. I would sometimes be the only guy, uh, the young guy would go. But every, no matter how late we were out the night before, I always made sure I went to Mass on Sunday. So they knew the Lord meant something to me and, uh, and my faith. And you'd be out in these different places with people and people come to me and ask me religious questions, spiritual questions. I'm like, why me? But it is new as the guy with the mask all the time. And we, my unit used to go out on maneuvers. I would do communion services in the field on Sundays. Uh -huh. So you're so, like an assistant chaplain so after chaplain, with the chaplain? Right. So, because we had no chaplain with our unit in the field. So mm -hmm. I was giving the Holy Communion, bring out to the field to give to the service people on Sundays. Or were the chaplains a particular role model to you at that point, do you think? Or? My, I really think my call came from the Eucharist itself and my love for the Eucharist. I just love going to communion. I love going for the tabernacle and the more the role models the priesthood came after I went to the seminary. Mm -hmm. And there were some good chaplains that supported me and prayed for me, but uh, it always went back to the Eucharist for me. Mm -hmm. Good, I want to take a quick break here. We're going to come right back there. So we're talking with Father Chris O'Connor today. You're watching On the Block. Stay with us. We're coming right back. Welcome back to On the Block. I'm Ed Wilkinson, and I'm speaking today with Father Chris O'Connor. So we were talking about the, uh, your Air Force career, and uh, you five years in there, and then you heard this calling to go to the priesthood, and you had to go to the, get some studies then, I guess. You had to get, you know, catch up with all the other guys at that point. Uh, how was that transition period, moving from the service now into a classroom setting? Was that difficult? It was a little hard at first. I went in the middle of the year. So I went in January. I had to do some college. When I was in the military, I had two years in night school. So I had to do two and a half years at Douglaston, which were phenomenal years. I really loved that place. When you're a king, a prince of a priest, one of the really awesome role models for me. Um, but a lot of the guys are very supportive. I mean, one of the best things about going to the seminary is the other seminarians. Mm -hmm. They're very supportive. And I guess going to night school and stuff like that helped me prepare. So it wasn't a complete switch. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then actually the regiment was still there. You had to go yeah. early in the morning, you had to do things. But and you were used like to that. Yeah, yeah. So I was used to the regiment, yeah. so that wasn't that hard of a transition. How about the camaraderie? I mean, you had camaraderie in the service and there's camaraderie there among your classmates in the seminary. Was there a sense of the sameness there? They were united together in the same purpose, very much so. I mean, my best friends today now are all priests, you know, and they're all guys I went to seminary with, you know, and uh, do anything for them. And I know they would do anything for me. Just like I still keep contact, especially the people I served in Germany with. Right. Still keep contact with them. Tell me a little bit about ordination day. What do you remember about, that was what, 1999? This? Right, June yeah. 5th, 1999 at St. James Cathedral what Basilica. What was it like for you? Greatest day of my life. You know, I walked into the Cathedral Basilica and it was only two of us ordained that day. The entire cathedral was uh, filled. Standing room only, people were out the door. And I was just amazed that so many people were there to see us. And actually, I broke down and started crying. Mm -hmm. As soon as I walked in the door, I got up to the front row, uh, stood next to my mother, and I kept crying. <laughs> I think I stopped crying at the gospel. Uh huh. Yeah, and great. that was Bishop Daly. Uh, Bishop Daly, yeah. in recent memory. Uh huh. Yeah, he was a great guy. So you, you get ordained, and um, is there a particular part of the ceremony that stands out in your mind? You know, a lot of people remember different parts differently. Is there a particular part of the ordination ceremony? For me, it's always been the laying down of the floor during the Litany of the Saints, uh, because you're imitating Christ at a moment, you're laying down in your life, mm -hmm. and you're saying, my life's no longer my own. It belongs to God, it belongs to the church. Mm -hmm. 
So Firmino is always emotional in hearing the people pray for us, praying to the saints. You talked a little bit in the first segment about your devotion to the Eucharist. Uh, were you able to maintain that and did that help you get through your studies, the college and then seminary years? Yeah, I try to do a holy hour every day the entire time when it's in the seminary, uh, praying for the tabernacle or our Lord exposed to the monstrance. Uh, if it wasn't from a devotion to Eucharist, there's no way I would have been ordained. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it got me through some hard times and it was there for me for some great times as well. How did your understanding of the Eucharist develop? I mean, uh, what were your thoughts about it? How did you understand the Eucharist in a more and more mature way? You know, St. John Vianney had a great line when he was to preach. He would turn to the tabernacle and point and say, he is there. That sums it up for me. He is there. It's God present. You know, it's the closest you can get to heaven. I think, praying before our Lord in the Eucharist. It's his body, his blood, his soul, divinity, uh, it's him. Bishop DeMarzio, you know, has preached on Holy Thursday when he preaches at the Chrism Mass. He talks to the priest and he tells them they should be spending time in front of the Eucharist every day. Is, how difficult is that to do in a busy priest's life today? Well, I've been pastor two parishes. My first parish was Presentation Blessed Virgin Mary in Jamaica, and now Blessed Virgin Mary Help the Christians, Woodside. Uh, the Blessed Mother has me close. Uh, in both parishes, my first decision was where to put the Blessed Sacrament Chapel in the rectory. Mm -hmm. So I built one in uh, Presentation and uh, in uh, St. Mary's as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jesus is right next to my bedroom, so I really don't have an excuse not to go visit him. <laughs> How about in your first assignment? Tell us what your first assignment was and uh, where was it, first of all? I was in St. Benedict, Joseph Labre in Richmond Hill for okay. five years. Had so. you ever heard of it before? I had known it because I, my first Mass was St. Teresa of Avila in Southlands on Park, the next parish over. And uh, Monsieur Jack O'Brien was my first pastor. Uh, and he was a great mentor, very newly ordained priest. Very tough guy, but very loving as well. You know, and I loved my assignment. When I got here, our school had 540 students. I was in school every day, I greeted every kid as they walked through the doors. And um, spent a lot of time teaching four grades a week you know, teaching the kids the faith. Now that, was that a school with um, a lot of non-Catholics in it? Yeah, it was over 60% uh, non-Christian. Right. We had a lot of Sikhs, a lot of Muslims. But oddly enough, I still can contact a lot of those kids, including non-Christians, particularly through social media. Uh, sometimes they contact me and ask about personal issues, and me to pray for them and stuff like that. And, uh, but St. Ben and Joseph Ray was a super Catholic school. The faculty was very Catholic and you had no doubt when you walked in the door as a Catholic school. Well, how does a non-Christian adapt to that then? I mean, did, did they, they were very open to it. Um, I taught them like everybody was Catholic. I taught them the faith. They had to take tests like everyone else. Um, they had questions. Unfortunately, some of the non-Catholics did better in their tests than the Catholics. <laughs> you know, but, um, but they were very open. I think it was a great opportunity for everyone to see different religions and that we all could live together in peace. Uh, I was there on, when 9-11 happened, and I remember going to each classroom to talk to the kids afterwards, and, and they, were, they were asking why it happened, and trying to explain the difference between hate, and how mm. people can hate what hate can do. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably the hardest day in my five years there. Yeah. yeah. What did you say to them? I, I told them that the terrorists were taught to hate from probably an early age, and when you hear something over and over and over again, that's what you believe. And so that's why we're trying to teach you how to love here. Not just love Catholics, but we're asking to love all of them. We made all of them made the image and likeness of God. How did you feel as a guy with a military background? And you know, when you saw something like that, the country's under attack. Uh, did you have a sense of we've got to go get these guys for this? <laughs> well, I, uh, I think everybody had that sense, no matter where I'm on that. I, and I had faith in our military we would eventually do so. Uh, but in that sense, though, I knew my place was my, with my parish. I had to be there for my people. Uh, because right after 9-11, uh, uh, we had the big uh, American Airlines plane crash in the Rockways, yeah. and three of our parishioners were on that plane. So in dealing with that, so dealing with the 9-11 and dealing with that, I knew that's my place. Yeah. And then I did spend one night working at Ground Zero uh, as they were looking for their remains yeah. of the victims. Why did you go down there? Um, they asked for priests to go, so I did a midnight to six shift. Uh, we found three firefighters, and I was on there, so they asked me to go down to the pit. I went uh -huh. down to the pit and bless the bodies before they brought them out of the, uh, the pit. Yeah. And to be there to also to talk to your workers and be yeah. a source of strength and encouragement. Well, what are some of the qualities that you feel that you carried over from your military background into the priesthood and 
helping you live the life as a priest? It's a funny question because people say you're really military. I, say, I think my personality fit the military more than the other way around. Uh, I like order, I like planning, I like being focused, I like knowing what my mission is, what to do. And I think that's what I carry with the priesthood, uh, trying to think of new ways to, to do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So even the parish now, and trying to find ways to proclaim the gospel might be different than how we did it 10 years ago. Sure. And when you were in the service, you studied computers and you worked a lot on that. Does that help you in your own administration of parishes today? Yeah, I, I was a computer systems communications operator. So uh, I always say technology's changed in 30 years, but I'm still usually the tech guy, whatever parish I go to. Uh -huh. All right, when we come back, we're going to take a quick break now. When we come back, we're going to talk about the two uh, parishes where you've been pastor now, two different parishes. We're talking with Father Chris O'Connor today. I'm Ed Wilkinson. This is On the Block. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to On the Block. I'm Ed. This is Father Chris, and uh, we've been talking about some of your uh, parish work, uh, Father Chris, but only five years ordained and you became a pastor, right? That, that's pretty quick, isn't it? Uh, very quick. Uh, but uh, I was ready for it, and I was very grateful for Bishop DiMarzio for making me pastor a uh, presentation with Virgin Mary in Jamaica. Yeah. Now that's, uh, that's a pretty lively parish, isn't it? It was very lively, <laughs> very lively neighborhood, very lively parish. Yeah. Tell us a little bit what kind of a parish, who makes up that parish, uh, you know, what goes on there? Um, when I was there, we used to get about 2,000 people on Sunday, about 85% of that would be Latino, the majority of them were people from Guatemala, and then after that, El Salvador. And of course, we have people from Ecuador and Mexico, and then the English-speaking community was uh, Caribbean and some of the old-time Germans were still in the neighborhood, but very few of them, and other people that were in the neighborhood. You're able to speak in Spanish, right? Yes, yeah. I uh, studied three summers in the Institute in Douglaston, one summer in Dominican Republic, one summer in Guatemala. Wow, so that's, that's kind of immersion, right? You get thrown right into that. Uh, what was five that hours a day, one-on-one -on -one with the teacher, and you live with a family that speak English, yeah. so if you want to eat, you gotta be saying in Spanish. <laughs> you better know what to ask for, right? So what was your experience like in Guatemala? Did you enjoy that? I loved Guatemala. Uh, I stayed with a family or adopted me as their son pretty much. And uh, I really learned Spanish very well. And I got to love the Guatemalan people. I, I got a lot of similarities between them and Ireland. Beautiful country, but very tragic. It has ended at 36 years civil war. A lot of suffering, a lot of pain. And I just related to the people a lot that way. And I was hoping one day I'll be able to serve the Guatemalan people. Yeah. And I did when I went to the presentation. Yeah. What special needs would you say that the Guatemalan people or Hispanic people would have that would be different than, say, the people that you served out in Richmond Hill? Um, well, the Guatemalans, especially in Jamaica, a lot of them were sending money home to support their families because of the great poverty. So you would not be uncommon to see like six guys live in one bedroom apartment you know, sheets separating their beds and they would send their money back home to support if they were married and children or parents or siblings. Uh, so looking for a better life for everybody from here and back home, uh, uh, great suffering. Yeah. What's your day like as a parish priest? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is no one day as the same. Like uh, Monday, we had two funerals. Uh, I buried a longtime parishioner. Uh, very involved, and then you know, I had to meet with my staff, I have some new people on staff, and have appointments in the evening, people for marriages, uh, spiritual direction. Uh, we have to go over and do a wake here and there. No one day is the same, it's always different. Uh, today uh, is going to be our first day of religious ed. I teach the confirmation class, so I'll be doing that for three hours. So every day is different. Yeah, there's a parish school there. Uh, the school closed back in 2005. Okay, so, so, and uh, what, would you use a regional school then? Is to send kids to a regional we're school? We're affiliated with St. Sebastian's Catholic Academy. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have about 400 people, uh, children in our religious ed program, mm -hmm. and that's where we got our focus. And uh, last year we took part of the Catholic Youth Ministry <laughs> Initiative of Diocese and hired a full-time youth minister. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year we're going to start using Life Team in our parish as uh -huh. a new way of reaching out to our young people. Yeah. So I'm very excited about that. Ministry to young people is, is really important and Bishop Damarzio has uh, really designated that as one of the objects, uh, objectives uh, you know, in his own ministry. Uh, it seems so many young people though are, it's hard to get their attention. They're all on these gadgets, you know. Right. How do you get their attention and say, listen, we've got something worthwhile for you to hear about? You know, Pope Paul VI uh, mentioned that uh, it's not teaching as much by witness, and I think you have to witness, and they see you're authentic, they listen, 
because we're not talking about uh, millennials anymore, and now it's Generation Z. Mm -hmm. And this is the first generation that's grown up totally with the internet and, and devices and stuff like that. So their attention. But I find when you're authentic and you speak from the heart, they listen more. Mm -hmm. and I think so. That's why you try. I try to share my love for the Eucharist and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think they perk up when I, I just talk about how much I love Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that gets them. Then you get a little opening and you pull them in. Mm -hmm. And the other way I try to reach young people is through adoration. Mm -hmm. I bring my confirmation class every week to bless a sacrament mm -hmm. and pray, praise worship music. It's a way to teach them how to pray differently. And yeah. I use that same line from St. John Vianney. He is there. What do you say to a young person who comes to you and says, Father, I'm thinking about becoming a priest? I say, that's awesome. Let's sit down and talk. Uh -huh. And I'm. Um, Ask them why they think about that. I share my story sometimes. I might recommend they read something or watch a movie, mm -hmm. depending on their age. And uh, until I'm going to pray for them, let's talk again. Mm -hmm. What do you do like when you have some free time and you want to relax and you know just calm down a little bit? What do you have some activities you like to do? I'm an avid reader, so I love to read. I have a Kindle my mom gave me for Christmas a few years ago. I like to read a lot of novels and I like to go to movies. Mm -hmm. And of course, hand out my priest friends. Sure. This is the year of vocations, and uh, the bishop has kind of put a campaign together to try to attract more people to the uh, priesthood and to the religious life in general. Uh, you think we're going to see more and more people coming at a later time in life, say like you were 30 when you were ordained, a little bit behind what the norm would be. You think uh, that's going to be the future? I don't know what the future holds. I don't request a ball, but I think. Uh, it goes back to the Catholic Youth Ministry Initiative too. I think as we engage more young people in the faith and get them on fire for the faith, then it'll be more open to vocations. So it could be younger or older. Uh, and I always go back to the Blessed Mother and to the Eucharist. With mm -hmm. Those two pillars, mm -hmm. I think we'll find more vocations. Yeah. Of course, Pope Francis says that sometimes we don't need new programs. We just have to open the doors and we have to be present to people. Uh, how has this Pope uh, affected your own priesthood and your spirituality? Um, I'm a big fan of St. John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, and they're the two that really have most effect on my priesthood, and they're yeah. my role models. Uh -huh. I really love Pope Benedict XVI. I think his clarity, his vision, and his faithfulness to the gospel are inspiring to me to this day. Uh -huh. I still read his readings. Good. Great. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Father Chris. Thank you for being with us today. You've been watching On the Block. I'm Ed Wilkinson. This is Father Chris O'Connor. Join us again next time for another interview on the block.